So we've finished talking about microcytic anemias where their red blood cells are small. We finished talking about normocytic anemias where red blood cell size are normal. Now we talk about macrocytic anemias where the MCV is over 100. And macrocytic anemia arises from impaired red blood cell production. So you're not making enough red blood cells, you have less red blood cells, and you have the same amount of hemoglobin. So you have too much hemoglobin per red blood cell. And remember, the red blood cell wants to maintain normal hemoglobin per um, concentration, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be larger than normal. It's going to divide less, so it's going to end up being larger than normal. So that's why you get a macrocytic anemia. Now we can divide macrocytic anemias into megaloblastic versus non-megaloblastic anemias. A megaloblastic anemia, which it took me forever to just figure out what the heck this was, it arises from impaired DNA synthesis. And you get production of abnormally large immature red blood cells. So these are called megaloblasts, hence the name. You abnormally large immature red blood cells. And the other key characteristic here is you see hypersegmented neutrophils. So causes of a megaloblastic anemia you want to know about include folate and vitamin B deficiency. We're going to talk about both of these. And a hy hypersegmented neutrophil is this. So if you look at a neutrophil, you look at its nuclei, you see no, this is the normal neutrophil on the right. It has around three, three lobes of the nuclei. This one has over five lobes in the nuclei that's hypersegmented. So this is very characteristic, pretty much super characteristic of a megaloblastic anemia. Again, from impaired DNA synthesis. Now, a non-megaloblastic anemia arises when there's impaired red blood cell production, but it's not a problem with the DNA synthesis. There's some other problem making, so you can't make red blood cells, but the DNA synthesis is fine. And causes of a non-megaloblastic anemia where you would not see, you would not see this in non-megaloblastic anemia, is alcohol can do it, liver disease, and then diamond black fence anemia, which we're going to talk about. So let's talk about megaloblastic now. We're going to focus on that for a second. Totally folate deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency. So folate deficiency is dietary causes is the dietary deficiency is the main cause. Folate we get from healthy stuff. I just think it's healthy stuff. You get it from green vegetables and fruit. So alcohol, alcohol so people who aren't eating enough green vegetables or fruit can become deficient and alcoholics are especially at risk. A lot of times in the question you can see it's an alcoholic. The reason why alcoholics are especially at risk are many reasons. First of all, these guys don't they're not eating as much, they're not taking as much nutrition. And second of all, the alcohol impairs a lot of things. It impairs folate absorption, it impairs folate utilization, and it impairs re recycling of the folate because that's something that your body normally does. You can recycle the folate you have, that you take in so you don't need to intake as much as you normally would. So alcohols are super at risk. Now a patient who has dietary deficiency are gonna, is going to develop folate deficiency within months because our body stores are minimal. And in alcoholics, it's even worse. I told you, remember, why, why would it be worse? I told you, what does it do to folate? What does alcohol do? Remember, it impairs absorption, utilization, and most of all, it impairs recycling. So due to loss of the recycling, you develop folate deficiency even faster in alcoholics. Now, other causes of folate deficiency other than dietary deficiency include increased folate use and drugs. So why would you increase folate use? Remember, folate you need for DNA synthesis. So if you have increased cell synthesis, for example, you have a, you have a, some other hemolytic anemia where you're breaking down red blood cells, you're going to make more. Or pregnancy, you're just getting a lot of new cell synthesis. That can lead to folate deficiency. And then drugs, for example, methotrexate. Now, do you remember what the mechanism of action of methotrexate was? Remember, methotrexate is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, so that can lead to folate deficiency. So, it causes dietary deficiency, increased folate use, and drugs. So, clinical features, how, how do we differentiate this? We see, let's say we see a megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. How do we know it's folate deficiency and not vitamin B12? What you do is you look at the labs, you look at homocysteine, and you look at methylmalonic acid. And you also look at neuro, um, just clinical picture. These guys don't have any neurologic symptoms. We're going to compare soon with vitamin B12. So why do I talk about homocysteine and methylmalonic acid? Because these guys are involved in the biochemistry reaction. You see homocysteine works together, combines with folic acid to become methionine with the help of vitamin B12. So you're not, enough, you're not making enough folic acid, so this stuff just builds up. This stuff is not made. So you have increased homocysteine. You see in this reaction, MMA, methylmalonic acid, folate is not involved in this reaction, so it's going to be normal. 
Again, no, no neurologic symptoms in folate deficiency. So, vitamin B12 deficiency, another name for it is cobalamin. Vitamin B12 is obtained from animal products, so meat, fish, eggs. So, folate is from healthy stuff, fruit and veggies, vitamin B12 from animal products. And we're going to talk about absorption of vitamin B12 in a second. Actually, right now. So, it's going to get to your stomach, and then it, once it reaches the small intestine, it has to be bound to intrinsic factor. Remember, where was intrinsic factor made? Where intrinsic factor was made by the parietal cells in the stomach. So, intrinsic factor binds to the vitamin B12, and it carries it all the way to the ileum. And that's where the vitamin B12 gets absorbed. So if you don't have an intrinsic factor, you don't get absorption of vitamin B12. So how causes of vitamin B12 deficiency then is problems in this absorption process. Problems with the intrinsic factor, problems with the ileum. So causes include pernicious anemia. So pernicious anemia, do you remember what pernicious anemia was? I mean, that was a problem where you have... You have the autoimmune destruction of intrinsic factor or the parietal cells themselves. When parietal cells make intrinsic factor. So at the end of the day, you get decreased intrinsic factor. And the other thing that you can get, other causes of vitamin B12 deficiency include damage to the terminal ileum. So it's things like Crohn's disease or just resection of the ileum can cause. If you don't have the ileum, you don't absorb vitamin B12. You have a problem. And then... The last thing is dietary deficiency is rarely the cause in for vitamin B12 deficiency except for in vegans because our body has really large stores of vitamin B12 so it takes years for us to use up all the vitamin B12 stores so except unless you have like a lifelong vegan who's not taking in any animal products then that's just in contrast to folate where diet dietary deficiency is the main cause in folate deficiency. So for labs what's going to happen to our homocysteine and methylmalonic acid in vitamin B12 deficiency? So we see that we're deficient in this, and this whole reaction goes down. So you're going to have increased methylmalonic acid, you're going to have increased homocysteine. And finally, you're going to see neurologic symptoms because vitamin B12 is important for myelination. So you're going to have impaired myelination, it's going to be symmetrical. You're going to get peripheral neuropathy, you're going to get numbness, tingling, pins and needles sensation, just sim it's general stuff, general neural stuff, and you're also going to get subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord again from impaired myelination. And the cords that the tracks to get damaged are the dorsal column and the cortical spinal tracks. So that's this is what it looks like. Remember those pictures I showed you dorsal column, cortical spinal tracks. And what were the symptoms? Would you get Pro the problems with the dorsal column? What happens? When dorsal column Im involved in vibratory sensation, proprioception, so you lose that. And then cortical spinal tract, remember that's the motor one, so you get a spastic per paresis. That's impaired movement with increased tone. This is the upper motor lesion. Remember, upper motor lesion, upper motor neuron lesions have increased tone, but it's going to be they're going to be um, par the pa you get paresis because you can't move. You damage the movement tract. So spastic paresis. So that's it for folate and vitamin B12 deficiencies. Remember, these are the megaloblastic macrocytic anemias. Megaloblastic means you see those hypersegmented neutrophils. You see megaloblasts, which are the abnormally large, immature red blood cells. The other cause of megaloblastic anemia that is less common, that we don't really, you just see a lot less of it, is erotic aciduria. This is a problem where you have an autosomal recessive defect in UMP synthase. So you have impaired conversion of erotic acid to UMP. And this is important in synthesis of DNA nucleotides. So this is deficient, UMP synthase deficient. So the clinical features you're going to see here are failure th to thrive and developmental delay. You're going to see megaloblastic anemia and the key is it doesn't correct with supplementation of folate and B12 because so, those are our other causes of megaloblastic anemia. Those are the more common ones. You supplement those first. If your anemia doesn't, doesn't improve then you want to start thinking about this. And the other thing, you're going to see elevated erotic acid levels in the serum and urine. Urine makes total sense. So the difference, differential diagnosis here is you're going to see another disease with increased erotic acid levels, and that's ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. So both of these will present with increased erotic acid levels in the serum and the urine. And the way you differentiate it is that erotic aciduria has the megaloblastic anemia, but doesn't have elevated ammonia. So it's opposite. Uh, ornithine transcarbamylase -carb deficiency has elevated pneumonia, but it's not, it doesn't have the anemia stuff. So that's it's easy to remember if you just remember that erotic aciduria is a megaloblastic anemia. 
then just know that ornithine transcarbamylase has elevated ammonia, erotic acid, aciduria does not. The treatment you give them, you can give them UMP. It just corrects the UMP deficiency. So simple as that. So that's the megaloblastic anemias. We talked about folate deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, erotic, acid, erotic aciduria. Now we're going to go to the non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemias. So the non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia, we talk, there's alcoholism, there's chronic liver disease, and then there's finally diamond black fan anemia. This is a problem in erythroid progenitor cells. Remember, the problem is not in DNA synthesis here. It's in, in red blood cell synthesis. So this is a problem in the progenitor cells for the red blood cells. So what you're going to see is it presents in infancy with macrocytic anemia, but it's non-megaloblastic. And you're going to see a short stature, facial abnormalities, and triphalangeal thumbs. So triphalangeal thumbs means you have, remember your thumb normally only has one knuckle, but this is a triphalangeal, so there's an extra knuckle there. And the other thing I want to note is short stature and anemia. I talked about another problem where you get short stature and anemia. And that was, do you remember what it was? It's, it was very brief. It was an aplastic anemia. Remember, Fanconi anemia has short stature as well as that aplastic anemia. So this is, this, that one was a normocytic. This one has short stature but a macrocytic anemia. So that's it for a review of macrocytic anemia is both megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic. Next lecture is just going to be a summary of all the anemias because it's been a ton. I just want to do a big picture overview so you get a general sense of where of just a big picture.